Hello, and welcome to my series on the CT of thoracoabdominal emergencies. I'm Dr. Benjamin Strong, the Chief Medical Officer of Virtual Radiologic, or VRAD. I started my career with an internal medicine residency and followed that with three years of work as an emergency physician. I then returned to training for a radiology residency and a fellowship in body and MSK MRI. In the course of my over 20 years in radiology, I have worked as a private practice radiologist, an academic radiologist, and for the last 17 years as a teleradiologist for VRAD. I have been the chief medical officer there for eight years and am licensed to practice in all 50 states. Here is our agenda for this series, which I have broken into nine sessions of eight cases each, all grouped by organ system. Our first session is pulmonary emergencies, and we'll begin with a case of COVID-19 pneumonia. The early manifestation of COVID pneumonia is ground glass density, which you can just make out here in the right lower lobe and in the left upper lobe. Obviously, the CT scan is far more sensitive for these findings. And here you can appreciate the peripheral ground glass density and linear densities more centrally consistent with crazy paving, another finding that is suggestive of a viral pneumonia. Here it is again, peripheral ground glass density, and crazy paving centrally, trending even towards consolidation here. Now, of course, neither of these findings is very specific, and even in conjunction are not diagnostic. The distribution and character of these densities does help, though. They are rounded, peripheral, and bilateral. As you can see, there are many other additional regions of involvement in the lungs. So that is a case of COVID-19 pneumonia. It was one of the first diagnosed in the United States. Our next case is a case of congestive heart failure. You see similar density here in the right lower lobe, ground glass density, and a reticular density consistent with crazy paving as well. But note the distribution. It is central within the lung lobes that it involves and does not extend to the pleural surface. Another important finding is present here in the right lung base, which is interlobular septal prominence, which makes that sort of hexagonal pattern. That's to be differentiated from the intralobular septal prominence we see with crazy paving. These findings in combination help to diagnose congestive heart failure. Note the multifocal involvement, all centrally placed within each lung lobe, and here in the lung base, interlobular septal prominence. That is a case of congestive heart failure. Our next case is an infected sequestration. You can see here on lung windows a collection of soft tissue gas and fluid suggestive of a necrotic pneumonia or lung abscess. Here on the cine, you can appreciate its extent and multiloculated character. But the critical finding here is on the soft tissue windows where you can see a systemic arterial supply originating from the aorta, which can be tracked into that region of pulmonary involvement. And that is the telltale diagnostic finding that allows you to confidently declare this an infected pulmonary sequestration extralobar type. Our next case is a pulmonary pseudoaneurysm. On lung windows, there is clear parenchymal density consistent with a pneumonia, and there are foci of gas more centrally, suggesting early destructive processes. 
There is the lung window for that one. You can see the consolidation and the foci of gas surrounding that central contrast enhancement, which we see here better on the soft tissue windows, a rounded focus of contrast density, which is contiguous with the adjacent pulmonary artery. You can definitely appreciate that on the cine. And even better on the coronal image, where you see a tiny neck communicating between that pseudoaneurysm and the right pulmonary artery. And there it is. So that is a destructive bacterial pneumonia with subsequent pulmonary pseudoaneurysm formation. Our next case is active tuberculosis. You can see a thick-walled cavity here in the right lung apex posteriorly, pretty much a classic location for active tuberculosis. Lower down, you can see a classic tree-in-bud pattern, which of course is nonspecific and can represent anything from viral bronchiolitis through lymphoma. But taken together, these findings are highly suggestive of active tuberculosis. There is the thick-walled cavity and the tree-in-bud pattern. This is something that needs to be communicated, most likely uh, precautions taken. A helpful hint as well is the mediastinal and hilar calcifications so typically seen in tuberculosis infections. That helps you distinguish this from perhaps uh, similar infections such as coccidioidomycosis. So that is a case of active tuberculosis. Our next case is miliary tuberculosis. This can be a difficult pattern to discern, but you can see looking to the edge of the involved lung always helps, and in this case allows you to identify the interstitial micronodularity typical of miliary spread. Involvement is, of course, extensive throughout both lungs, typically the case here. Remember, these patients are frequently skin test negative, and in addition, their sputum usually does not yield diagnostic bacteria. And here again, the telltale calcifications in the hyla, allowing you to uh, distinguish this from coccidioidomycosis or perhaps even metastatic disease. So there is a case of miliary tuberculosis. Our next case is a pulmonary embolism, but a rather unusual one. There is, of course, a filling defect here in the right pulmonary artery. But note also, there is near complete atelectasis of the left lower lobe. Moving down, you can see there is compression of the left lower lobe bronchus right here by infrahylar adenopathy, which shows small foci of hypodensity consistent with necrosis. All of this is clearly concerning for metastatic disease, and we can see more of that below the diaphragm, where there are multiple heterogeneous peripherally enhancing lesions in the liver, and there is a large mass in the left adrenal gland, which is contiguous with a left renal mass. Lastly, you can see soft tissue density with enhancement extending into the left renal vein consistent with tumor invasion. All of these findings come together to give you a diagnosis of renal cell carcinoma with widespread metastases, hyalur adenopathy causing left lower lobe collapse, bronchial compression, one of the nodes, right, and ultimately a hypercoagulable state with tumor invasion of the left renal vein resulting in a pulmonary embolism. So quite a complex case. Uh, of note, 
this patient is essentially deprived of four-fifths of his pulmonary function, one left lung lobe being atelectatic, and the three of his right lung all deprived of appropriate pulmonary flow. So this is quite an emergent presentation and was, interestingly enough, one of our first identified by artificial intelligence algorithms. So that leads me to point out uh, that I don't consider artificial intelligence much of a threat. I think it's a helpful adjunct. Uh, but while we can create algorithms that can identify pulmonary emboli, uh, we can't create algorithms yet that identify renal masses, uh, vein invasion, widespread metastases, and resultant pulmonary embolism. I think that kind of cognitive integration will remain the job of the radiologist for years to come. Our next case is one of a ventricular septal defect with resultant Eisenmenger syndrome. This patient has massive enlargement, uh, thickening, and intravascular clot of the pulmonary arteries consistent with long-standing severe pulmonary hypertension, and increased flow. In addition, there are pulmonary arterial filling defects, both chronic appearing and peripheral, but also here in the left lower lobe, centrally, and with all the appearance of an acute embolism. Lastly, let's look at the cardiac findings. You can see massive enlargement of the right atrium, marked thickening of the right ventricular myocardium, and a ventricular septal defect. Note the absence of contrast within the left atrium, proving that the flow of blood is passing from the right ventricle to the left ventricle. A reversal of flow known as Eisenmenger syndrome, and most likely resulting from the increase in pulmonary pressure from that acute pulmonary embolism. So there are those enlarged pulmonary arteries with wall thickening, calcification, and intraluminal thrombus consistent with an acute pulmonary embolism. And there is the reversal of flow through a ventricular septal defect. That is a cine worth watching again. Chronic and acute pulmonary emboli, a ventricular septal defect. That is a case of a VSD with Eisenmenger syndrome resulting from acute pulmonary embolism. That concludes session one, pulmonary emergencies. Thanks for watching.